Welcome back to Free Rider. We have a very nice ride lined up today and these two beautiful fat bobs to cruise around on. And this coincidentally is the first Harley Davidson model I've ever ridden. So I'm very excited to get back on one, but I'm also very excited to introduce our guest today. She's a star of stage and screen, a producer, director, philanthropist, an avid Harley Davidson enthusiast, Danielle Coleman. How are you? <laughs> what an amazing introduction. That was okay, that was, wasn't it? That was far, far and beyond what I expected. And, and you've, uh, you've brought an entourage with you as well. I have. I've got, of, my, of I've got my friends. Wonderful. Yeah. I felt like I could have embellished it a little bit more. No, no more embellishment. I'd be embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so good to have you today. Oh, thank you. I'm super excited to be here. Have you ridden the Fat Bob before? I have. Many, many moons ago, though. I haven't ridden a Fat Bob for ages. And I want to say, though, this has always been, because I'm a bit of an ascetist, I do like details. It's not just how the ride feels, it's how it looks as well. So, for me, this has always been my favourite colour. I love this. It's kind of rusty brown. So, put aside all the engine stuff and how it feels. Give me a good colour. <laughs> we're sold. Well, oh, the, this bike this. is my first love ah, as well. Okay. It's the first bike I got on with Harley Davidson when mm -hmm. I started riding Harleys. So I'm pretty keen to you know, get going on one again, see mm -hmm. if it performs the same as I remember it. Okay. Should we hit the road? I think we should. All right, let's do this. Bye bye. <laughs> Danielle, just yeah. to wind it back. Yes. How did you get started acting? Like, what was that road like and, and the beginning of your career like? Yeah, I think it was um, really, uh, you know, I've, I've always been into escapism of some form. And I, <laughs> like, um, it, when I was really young, like when I was, you know, seven or eight, I would turn up at school with my mother's wardrobe and I would make people dress up in her clothes. Ooh. Oh, and right. um, <laughs> this has got more talk than what I expected. Um, I would make um, people dress up in her clothes and I would make them perform plays that I've written. And, and I just, I've never felt like I wanted to be an actor. It was just that it was all part of my um, life forever. Yeah. Like it's just, I, I just, am, I, I'm a performer and which has been a gift and a curse. So it's, a bit, it's kind of like inherently in your DNA, I suppose. It is. And, you know, as, as much as it's been um, fantastic for this line of work, it's certainly not, um, it's dashed any hopes that I have of being the shy person in the corner of the room. <laughs> like, I've always wanted to be the one who sits in silent reflection and everyone's like, oh, who's that? But I'm not. I'm always the kind of the fulcrum of noise and, and, and chaos. Um, but I, I've always loved... I mean, human beings are eternally fascinating to me in all our complexities, our flaws, our, uh, you know, our, our strengths and weaknesses and, and everything. And to be able to, you know, find characters and take them off the page and put them on stage or on screen and, to, and make them um, characters of, of agency and wholeness is, is just, it's my great joy in life. Yeah, I love that. I, yeah. Uh... It's, it's a pretty big contrast between stage and screen. Do you have a preference? Are you more theatre? You know what? Now, I'll tell you what. Now, post, not post-COVID, but now that we're sort of swinging in this way of, of learning how to be on set, where things have changed dramatically in terms of how we, um, you know, the, the, the intimacy has changed immensely, not only just on, in workplaces, but in life, but on the set, um, it's changed quite a lot. And I always really enjoyed you know, the kind of freedom that you'd have and the sort of relationships that, that manifest on set with, you know, the crea creative relationships are very free and they're very nuanced. And I think a lot, of, a lot has changed um, in terms of um, how we relate in the workplace now. Um, so uh, it's, it's quite staged. There's a lot of very staged things and it's taken the electricity out of a set for me. Yeah. Um, so I really liked, I think, um, theatre, I'm kind of leaning more towards theatre at the moment because um, you you have that, um, uh, you just, it's, there's a, a place where you can really throw ideas around and you're not sort of worrying about 
too much about the technical side of of filming and I like that you know like and, and you can kind of connect with your audience right they're right in front of you you 100%. know if something's hitting if something's working yeah you can look at that person in the front row and go would you stop crinkling the chip packet <laughs> <laughs> I guess most notably, uh, Australian series, Wentworth. Yes. Working with my good friend Pia Miranda. I know. She got her eyes poked out. <laughs> how, was, uh, how was that experience? Because that was, that was a big, that was a big role. And that's was, actually what yeah. you won, uh, won your Logie for. Yes, it was. Um, yeah, I, I'd been nominated for another two. Oh, my, my indicator keeps going off. Um, I, I've been nominated for uh, uh, one before for Underbelly. I played the the crime matriarch Kate Lee from the 1920s, and for under the Underbelly series. Yeah. So I've been nominated for that, and I've been nominated for a Logie a few times before um, with other projects. But then I finally got it um, with with Wentworth. Um, it was, it's, I mean, it's been uh, life-changing for me, not, not because of the, 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 the caliber of, of the project, but actually more so the, the life after it. You know, I've had so many trips overseas and meeting fans and, you know, kind of, you know, hanging out with um, people whose lives have been profoundly changed by the show. Um, and I get to meet all these extraordinary people whose who's stories, and that's what I live for, is stories. Are you getting hungry? Should we stop for some food? I know there's a great spot up here, uh, Glen Forest Gourmet, so yeah. let's stop and grab some brekkie, maybe Thank some uh, coffee. Yay, that's let's cool. do it. Daniel, tell me how you got started with motorcycles. Uh, I used to ride uh, farm bikes. I spent a lot of time on farms, and then, uh, but riding legally. <laughs> uh, yes. It was, um, I, I, I started riding a lot when I was working on uh, the Toe Wentworth that I was working on, and um, I, I think it was just to um, have something to do on the weekend or after work where I wasn't still. You know, my mind wasn't filled with all of the, the content from the job because it was such an intense role. So I needed something else to concentrate on. So I started then and I, I became part of a motorcycle um, garage there that I could go there and, and be part of a community that had nothing to do with my acting work. Um, I love putting things together and taking things apart. You know, I think that's, that's yeah, kind yeah. of like what I do with my work, you know, taking people apart and putting them back together again. But I also love doing it. I'm a really crafty person. So, you know, just looking at how bikes work and taking them apart, putting them back together um, and, and I just have kind of continued um, you know for, forming a relationship with Harley of course yeah. um, they've been amazing and then just meeting people um, riding with big groups of women which has been fantastic well it's a fantastic part of motorcycling are the communities and I think as you're starting to ride and learning to ride and learning techniques and meeting people having community around you or being part of a community kind of pushes your um, riding forward and you learn stuff from other people you make great relationships and for me that's something I love about motorcycles is that sense of community yeah yeah and you know for me too it's I'd love to see more female riders on the road oh, I yeah. feel like there's been you know that they've traditionally been on the back of bikes you know rather than be, not riding their own riding their own, own course and I love the idea now that there are more females riding um, you know, I've, I've ridden with some fantastic large groups of, of women. Um, we did a run where you pass a baton around the world. They did this round the world relay, and so I got to run the leg from um, from Auckland um, halfway down the North Island, and then you pass yeah. the baton to the next group of women. And we were, I was riding with I don't know 300 women. It was wow, so that's great. It was so, so much cool. fun. Um, but that thing too of what has traditionally been a, a sort of a male pastime, or, yeah. um, and, and that's not the case anymore, it's kind of like surfing, you know, like there are so many more females out there surfing. And, and um, yeah, I, I, I like the idea, like a lot of women will say, oh my god, you're riding, and it gives them, um, you know, excuse the pun, but license to, you know, they yeah. feel like well, they can Well, it's representation, now. right? Yeah, and of course. We know how important representation is. I think a big part of Harley-Davidson, the Harley-Davidson community is 
being inclusive mm. and representing all kinds of riders, creed, race, religion, you can be whoever you want to be and still ride a Harley. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, for me, being, um, you know, having the, the um, privilege of being able to attend some of their rallies and, you know, my, one of my favourite moments <laughs> was Tell when me. I got asked to lead out. There must have been 1,500 riders um, on the Thunder Roll down in Queenstown wow. and just through all of that valley through to Cadrona and I was just like... It's so powerful. This is amazing. Just <laughs> looking places, back ah. and seeing this. <laughs> You know, like I, I'm, I, I can be incredibly conservative, but I'm also a complete motorhead as well. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like this appeals to every part of my yeah. motorhead sensibilities. As I saw on the road today, oh. you ride very well. <laughs> oh, thank you. What did you I think of the fat box? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I really, it's it's good to have a, a bike that's incredibly robust that you can really throw around. Like it took me a while just to get in. Once I was getting into it and getting on those corners, it was really great. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, one it of the good. coolest things about being a Harley Davidson ambassador is you get to actually ride all the different bikes. Yeah. Have you got one that's been standing out, one that's your favorite? Oh, it's difficult because I, I put that into two categories. There are ones that are like very classic that are not being um, produced anymore um, that I got to ride the little uh, 70, 72, yeah. um, which I loved. Yeah. Um, but um, recently the you no know, Sportster S has been pretty oh, amazing. No. I yeah. like the Sportster S too. We just Ooh. did a piece on it. They move very, very well, those Sportster S's. Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, they have... Well, that's a note for HQ, Sportster S over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, the, every ride is, you know, depending on where you're riding and how you're riding. You know, there's a bike that suits all of that. You know, yeah. I've got I've got bikes that I prefer to have if I'm going on a long ride. Yeah. You know, just um, I mean, you, you know, you've got the, any of the glides are beautiful. Well, that's it. Well, I'm on a road glide special now. I feel yeah. like I would never have ridden the road glide special until you know it was presented to me at the dealership. They were like, "You would love this bike," and I was like, "Would I?" And now it's like yeah. the only thing I want to be. I'm not taking it back. Like, get out the way. Yeah, you know exactly. But then you know. Like sometimes if I'm just whipping around town, you know, you know, live wire is pretty sexy for that. Yeah, live wire. You know, there's, there's, it's uh, depending on where you're riding, and, and like, you know, I've, I talked before about riding in the states. I think I was just on a little, um, I was on a, a little sporty, and it was just the roads that I needed something more that had more suspension and it was more comfortable on my, yeah. on, on my bum. But you know, those little bikes are perfect for around the city, yeah. but a long ride. And I, and I love that about Harley is that you've got lots of choice. Yeah, I, I think, think that's just, fantastic. Come on, United, we ride. Yeah. Reach out, reach out to your fellow sisters and say, hey, can we go for a ride? That's what I, that's what I do. I just go, hey, do you feel like going for a little ride? You know, it might be just, oh, let's just go over there to the cafe over there. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, on that should note, we finish these off and jump we back We should. Mice? I'd love to. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Safe riding. Now, I mentioned philanthropy in the intro and I'd love to talk to you about that because I know you're doing some really great stuff with some of the NGOs that you're working for and the not-for-profits. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your work there? I've been um, an ambassador for Child Fund New Zealand and Australia for quite a number of years now, maybe 10 over 10 years. Um, I've travelled with them to different territories where they work, so um, East Africa, Vietnam, Cambodia, I'm also at the moment doing a drive for Ukraine uh, for the refugees that are mostly ending up now in Moldova and um, and most of the most of the charities I work with are very child centric so um, it's about protection of, of children primarily and then their families um, yeah. but I also am working locally um, with um, a, an organization called Shine for Kids that um, are helping kids whose parents or caregivers had been incarcerated um, um, with mentorship programs, um, supporting them while they go for their visits, because of course at the moment they haven't been able to visit because of COVID. Um, and just, I guess, trying to also break the cycle of, of intergenerational um, um, offending, which can happen, and especially more so in the indigenous communities, yeah. sadly. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work with that, which has been really great. Was, um, was that a cause you felt like you got a bit connected to through the roles that you'd been playing, or was that just you just kind of felt like you had a heart for that that style of work? Um, I think that it, there was a logical um, relationship through Wentworth. Yeah. 
um, but also the organisation that I'm involved with in New Zealand, Heartspeak Worldwide. We yeah, I was going to ask a you lot about of, Yeah, we work with a lot of at-risk youth that are part of, that have sadly, you know, been part of the criminal justice system at a very young age and trying to, you know, once again, it's, um, you know, offer them different mentorships and mentorship programs and different choices and just different routes of education if they're not able to to uh, I guess um, to be involved with what what would be a conventional education system how it's set up you know going from school to nine to three because they don't have the support from their family or there's other mitigating circumstances that that they that's hindering their their pro, um, their development then we're offering them more creative solutions and you know, to me, when I was at school, I was really naughty. <laughs> I was super naughty. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. And but you know, there, and I was waving flags, and I, you know, and and thankfully there were a couple of people in my life that went, hold on a second, she's not a bad person. She's just struggling in certain areas. And you know, it was through those people that came to me with creative solutions that I was able then to find, I guess, my own self and and stop acting out so badly. Yeah. Just, um, just I, because she made a mess doesn't mean she is a mess. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I just, <laughs> I like, you know, I think it's important to, you know, offer, uh, especially, you know, people, adolescents who are still in development, the world is confusing enough, you know, without other things that might be, you know, discrediting your experience. Let's talk a little bit about your production company. Ah, yes. 411 Productions. I like the name very much. <laughs> Do you know what 411 is? It's uh, it's the it's the 411. It's the hats. It's uh, I it's what's going on. That. It's what's Lots going of on. Lots don't know that. So um, yeah, 411 came about. I just, I guess to me it was like, you know what? I'm, I mean, there's some brilliant practitioners out there. God, there's some great stories being told on on our screens and uh, you know, and in our theatres. Um, but I, there was a, a, there was a deficit in the area of, of, you know, for me, I think, you know, very complex female characters on screen, female with agency, and from our part of the world as well, mm. and, um, and you know, underrepresented um, faces on screen, and I got together with Nicole De Silva, who was um, a very, uh, you know, a valued colleague of mine on Wentworth, yeah. and so I went to her and said, look, you know, this is my idea about starting a production company, so we can actually do our own stuff. Yeah. And so that's how that came about. So um, we've got some really good things in development at the moment. Well, the writing here is pretty nice, eh? Yeah, yeah, it's gorgeous. This is what I came here for. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, no, plans. I mean, obviously came here to meet you too. Oh, uh, well, fine. <laughs> More importantly, the writing. Appreciate so. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks very much for today. It's been awesome. It was. <laughs>